Due to technical difficulties, this is a recreation of the sermon delivered on Sunday, June 19th. Our scripture today is from John 5, verses 1 to 9. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. In this sermon series, we've been talking about how radical Jesus' teachings were to those who first heard them, and for that matter, to those of us who hear them today. Some Bible scholars have called his Sermon on the Mount the Great Reversal because he turned the world's values upside down. For example, teachings like love your enemies and bless those who curse you are diametrically opposed to what the world, world teaches. So far, we've said that he taught us that we need to be broken in order to be whole and to be emptied so that we can be filled. In short, the message of this series is we need to come to the end of ourselves before God can do what is best and what he wants in our life. We might be compared to a drowning man in the ocean. Many of you have heard that oftentimes rescue workers have to let the drowning man come to the end of his efforts to save himself. They let him flail until he can't flail anymore because if they try to rescue a person still trying to save themselves and not willing to trust being saved by someone else, he might drown himself and the rescuer too. When they come to the end of themselves, then the lifeguard can save them. It's the same way with God. He can't save us until we stop trying to save ourselves. We have to admit to or submit to accepting and receiving his help. We have to become helpless to be helped. And it's not easy especially for men. We don't like the, even the appearance that we need help. We won't ask for directions, for example. Who needs a GPS? We're men. Studies done for the Journal of American Psychologists found that men were less likely to ask for directions. Men are less likely to go to the doctor. And men, when they do seek medical help, ask fewer questions and share fewer symptoms. Men die seven years younger than others, maybe at least partly because of their lack of desire to admit we need help. Pastor Kyle Eidemann tells the story of a family kayak trip he took with his kids. He decided just to get his son and take the kayak and get in the river and go there near Louisville, Kentucky, where he lives. Pretty soon, all the kids wanted to go along, so there's Kyle and his four kids, and the plan was they would just go as far as they would like and then call mom to come pick them up. Mom pointed out that this wasn't really a plan at all, that they should check Google Earth and map out an actual bridge where they would come and meet together and she could pick them up. Kyle confesses that this made him even more determined to do it his way. After all, he had a phone, it had a GPS on it, he was a man, he didn't need to have a plan. After 45 minutes in the water, the four kids were beginning to get tired. There hadn't been a single place where they could have come out of the sh- on the shore and be able to climb out if they wanted to. He decided to check the GPS on his phone, which he had secured in a Ziploc bag. It was gone, presumably lost at sea or at least at river. And this meant he had no idea where they were and no way to call his wife. After two hours, everyone was hot, sweaty, wet, and exhausted. His son said, my arms don't work anymore, Dad. And the sun would start to set soon. At three hours, they spotted a woman doing yard work in a yard that sloped all the way down to the river, a perfect place to get out. Eidelman says he started to call out to her for help, but something snapped and stopped him. His daughter said, Dad, aren't you going to ask her for help? He said, no. He was too proud to admit that he needed help. So he said, I'm sure there'll be a bridge just around the corner. There wasn't. An hour later, it was almost dark, and he was prepared to ask anyone he saw for help. Then they came to a bridge. They climbed out and walked up to the road, where even now, rather than be seen asking for help, he sent his eight-year-old son out to flag down a car and then pretended to be just coming out of the bushes like he was catching up. 
A car stopped and the driver let them borrow a cell phone to call home. His wife answered the phone with the words, let me guess, you lost your cell phone, you have no idea where you are, and you need me to come pick you up. Oh, the links that we'll go to in order to not have to admit we need help. David writes in Psalm 18, In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of the deep waters. All of us find ourselves in deep waters sometime. And in those times, God uses brothers and sisters in Christ to help us. And sometimes he helps us himself. In the last sermon series, we talked about one of those phrases that many people think is in the Bible, but isn't. That is, God helps those who help themselves. A Barna Group survey found that 8 out of 10 people think this phrase is in the Bible. We love it and we live by it, but it's not in the Bible. And it's not entirely true. For the more correct thing would be to say, God helps those who can't help themselves. Sometimes I am the one who's helpless. When it comes to my own sin, I'm totally unable to fix the mess I'm in, and so are you, and we need help. Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We need a savior. We don't deserve the sacrifice that Jesus made for us to make us right with God. We could never earn it, but I thank God for it. When we're helpless and we know it, we're open to receive the transforming help that God wants to give us. One helpless man was the story of this man in John chapter 5, where Jesus went up to Jerusalem at the Sheep Gate in the northeast corner of the Temple Mount, and we are told that this place is called Bethesda. Some Bibles say Bethesda. And it's surrounded by five covered colonnades, and there disabled people would come and lie the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And one was there that had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? And the man, rather than answer the question, replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get into the pool, someone gets down, down and gets ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once he was cured. This man had been helpless for 38 years. Maybe there was a time he dreamed of a miracle, but years had passed and that miracle never came. He probably stopped hoping, stopped expecting, stopped praying. He accepted his condition. It is what it is. Vicki and I visited the site of the Pool of Bethesda. It's right outside the northeast gate on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. A church built by the French crusaders there in 1131 stands right beside the ruins of the pool. And some later manuscripts of the Bible include verses 4 and in, in part of 3 in, in chapter 5 of John, where it says, the disabled came there and they waited for the moving of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each disturbance would be cured of whatever disease he had. So it's clear that's why the man was there and why he felt like he couldn't be cured it explains his situation. The first one in would be healed, and he could never be the first one in. There's no way he could be that quick to get in the pool. Jesus asked him what seems like an unusual question. Do you want to get well? The man probably thought he was finding fault with him, thinking that he, he was still an invalid for his own choosing. And he, he gave his excuses of why he couldn't be healed. But Jesus just really wanted to know, do you really want my help? After 38 years, have you given up hope? Have you stopped trying to get into the pool? Are you permanently planted in this spot and content to just receive a few coins of mercy offered to you by compassionate people ever so often? Have you become used to this situation and, and defensive? Jesus, Jesus asked him if he wanted to be healed. He didn't answer the question. He recited his excuses. He said, I don't have anyone to put me in. Kyle Eidelman in his book, The End of Me, says there's a lot of people who like to hang around the, the waters without actually wishing to be healed. A lot of people come to church but don't really want God's help. Jesus wanted to know, are you content with where you are or are you ready for something better? And he asked us the same question. Are you content with where you are or are you ready for something better? 
You might say, well, why wouldn't someone want help? Well, one reason why someone wouldn't want help is they're afraid of change. This man had been doing this for 38 years now. This life, for whatever it was worth, was all he knew. What would he do if he was healed? He would have to get a new routine. No more accepting charity by the pool. Probably have to get a job. And what would he do? He hasn't been trained to do anything. Change scares people. There's comfort in the status quo, even a bad status quo. My uncle had to wear glasses all of his life. And then in his upper years, he had his cataracts removed and found that because of the surgery, he no longer needed glasses that he had worn his entire life. But he was used to wearing glasses. He wasn't comfortable with the idea of not wearing glasses. So he had clear glass lenses put into his eyeglass frame so he wouldn't have to change. It's the nature of many people that they would rather remain in an undesirable situation than risk the unknown of what change might bring. Who else doesn't want to be healed? Well, someone who's in denial of reality. There's a story of a 34-year-old woman on the internet who had a 300-pound tumor removed from her body. There's a documentary on it. You can read about it and see about it if you just Google her. 300-pound woman or 300-pound tumor from woman. The tumor was twice the size of her initial body weight. And so the question you might be asking is, how on earth did she let it go on so long? And her answer that she gave was, she had figured it would go away on its own. She denied reality. And when it didn't, and it gotten so out of hand, she delayed seeking help for another reason. Like so many others, she didn't seek help because she felt ashamed. The woman with the tumor came to realize it wasn't going to go away, but she was embarrassed by it. Asking for help would mean doctors would treat her like a museum specimen. There would be documentaries made about her. There would be questions about why and how she got to this point. She could no longer hide her shame at home behind closed doors. The longer she waited, the more embarrassing it came, became. I think some of you probably can relate to that. I know one of the situations I find myself in sometimes is I see someone and I think I should know them, but I don't remember them. And I pretend I know them and talk to them. And then I think, you know, I'll probably never see them again. And then they start coming to church or something. And after a year, I'm like, I still don't know their name and I can't ask them now because I'm embarrassed by the fact that I should know it. And how can I ask them now? So we oftentimes will get caught in our own shame. I've learned that it's unhelpful to, to worry about what other people think, but that's what we do. Pride takes a terrible price. We sometimes will actually choose to suffer so we won't have to have other people know what we're going through. Kyle Eidemann says, I've learned it's unhelpful, maybe even counterproductive, to offer to people help who haven't asked for it and who won't admit they need it. Nothing's going to change until those people come to the end of themselves and willingly pick up the phone to ask for help. Oftentimes as a pastor, someone will come up and say, oh, my, my nephew or my daughter or so-and-so, so, so, they're really messed up and would you go see them? Kyle's response to them would be, here's my card, tell them to call me. He says, until they're ready to, to admit they need help and ask for help, they're not gonna be helped. Until we recognize we're helpless to save ourselves, we're doomed. It's only the person who's looking for a savior who can be saved, who recognizes that, that they are powerless, who can receive the power that comes from God's spirit in us. None of us want to humble ourselves and ask for it. It's the same as admitting that we can't do something on our own. And we all know that some people hide behind those words, I can't, I can't. Some people use it as a lazy excuse for what they really mean is I won't. But there are occasions when people really and truly can't. And there are realities that all of us face where we will find ourselves at the end of our abilities. I've done what I can, but I can't live the life of a Christian, for example, without Christ. I can't handle the problems of my own sin, and I can't make it on my own. The man at the pool was healed and then empowered to stand up and walk, and he did nothing to get the healing but it came with a chance for him to respond, to obey, to pick up his mat and walk. And God's forgiveness for us is, is his grace to us. It's nothing that we can do for it. But he also empowers us to stand up and walk into a new life if we obey and we respond. To take on each day through the power of the Holy Spirit a new, new purpose. 
we must come to the end of ourselves to be able to listen to what Jesus says and to do what Jesus says. The life you have is not the life you must accept. You need only to ask for help. The more helpless you are, the better. The more open you will be to the help that only he can offer. So Jesus asked you this morning the same question he asked that man beside the pool. Do you want to get well? Are you content with where you are? Or are you ready for something better? Amen.